Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another uh, of the National Orthopaedic Alliance webinars. And today we're concentrating on the National Consultant Information Portal, our program, and its orthopaedic rollout. And um, I want to welcome, first of all, um, Stephen Lois and Deborah Higgs, who've come to explain what it's all about, how it might be used in the future. And um, the idea is that hopefully in, in, the, in the very near future, we'll be using it for appraisals and possibly also unit meetings, but we'll thrash that out later on. Um, in the usual way, just to say this, this is being recorded and it will be available to members usually after about 24 hours. Um, all the all your other participants are on mute. If you have any questions, put it in the question box. If you have any issues about connection, etc., use the chat feature. We'll be doing two polls today. One is a sort of an entrance poll to see how much you know about NSIP, and then we'll be doing an, an exit poll after the presentations to see where people feel they may go with this extremely useful, in my opinion, portal. Uh, so just a little update. So uh, last May, we, we talked about um, Never Events, very interesting uh, webinar, lots of feedback. Uh, since then, more Omicron hanging around, I'm afraid. it's As you can see, it's affecting staff, it's affecting patients, cancellations. So even though people are not getting sick, it's certainly influencing our ability on our NHS recovery of uh, orthopedic services. Um, lots of pressure still on NHS recovery and for many hospitals, we're not quite there yet. So um, for us, ironically, we, we relaxed like many other hospitals, our COVID isolation policy. And then only two weeks later, the peak hit us in Shropshire and we're actually uh, going back to some of the old rules again. So we've gone back to some uh, wearing a face mask in clinical areas. Uh, so I don't need to tell you there's some politics going on in the NHS. Uh, Steve Barclay um, has just replaced Sajid Javid as health secretary. And the usual sort of um, statement from the government uh, about how much money they're investing and the, the usual 50,000 more nurses. Uh, he, just to assure everybody, he is a solicitor. I think he had a tiny little bit of influence as a junior minister uh, a couple of years ago, uh, but I don't think that lasted more than a few months. So it's a weird time to have all this happening when we're implementing the new ICSs uh, and lots of lots of stuff going on. So we'll just have to see how that pans out. So uh, just to introduce NSIP, the National Consultant Information Program. Uh, I think PRE is for program, uh, I think, but um, we'll soon hear about that. Uh, I won't say much about it because um, Stephen and Debbie are going to tell us all about it, but um, we've had um, a trial version uh, rolled out to us in Oswald Street. Uh, I've registered and I've logged in to see my data and we've shared some data among some of our unit colleagues. Uh, very, very powerful data. I think it's very reliable data and the HES data that used to be quite unreliable, I think is now tidied up a lot and now quite reliable. So it's a very powerful tool. So on that note, I just want to welcome uh, Stephen Lois. We've um, got Debbie uh, Higgs, who is a consultant shoulder surgeon from Stanmore, also clinical lead for the NSIP uh, to present here today. So on that note, I'll stop sharing and uh, I go straight to you, Stephen. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Comac. I will begin to share some presentation slides. Perfect. Um, they are hopefully now appearing onto the screen. Uh, so just to introduce myself, um, I'm Stephen Lewis. I'm one of the NSIP uh, implementation leads. I'm the implementation lead for orthopedics, spinal surgery, neurosurgery, vascular surgery, and oral maxillofacial, um, working alongside Debbie uh, and 
the rest of the team to um, help developments in the portal and we're looking to give you this presentation today to engage with you as a collective as a community to get you interested in nzip and then following this to get your feedback and also to let you know that we're looking to provide demonstrations to uh, teams to take you through your own data to get you signed up with access to the portal uh, and to get you using NZIP uh, in uh, in anger and in practice. Sorry, uh, Stephen, Debbie, can I just, like to Stephen, I'm just going to, Stephen, I'm just going to butt in for one minute. Sorry, what I forgot to do is put up the poll. Um, so it might be useful to put it up before you start, if that's okay, Stephen. So mm -hmm. Fallon, if you wouldn't mind popping up the poll there, please. Thank you. And it's uh, very simple. Three options. Are you familiar with NZIP? Yes. And you've registered as a user. Yes, I've found but I've not registered, I've never used it, and no, I've no knowledge of NSIP. So uh, if, please, if you could, um, if you could vote now. Thank you. And if we could pop up the answers. Okay, so that's very useful information for NSIP, I think, and Stephen. So half of us have no knowledge of NSIP. Uh, you can close that down now, Fallon. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Stephen. Away you go. I interrupted you. Pardon. Not a, not a problem whatsoever. I was just going to hand over to uh, Debbie to give a, a little overview of herself. Hi. Yes. Um, uh, so my name is Deborah Higgs, as introduced by Cormac, and I'd like to thank um, the National Orthopaedic Alliance for inviting us. Um, I'm a consultant, children and elbow surgeon at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital in Stanmore, where but I'm also the clinical director for specialist surgeries. Um, regarding my role in NSIP, I was um, asked at the beginning of the year to be one of the clinical leads um, focusing on, on upper limb, along with Professor Tim Briggs, who I'm sure everyone knows, um, who is sort of leading on, on, on the lower limb. Um, and my role, um, along with Stephen, is to um, to roll the programme out for orthopaedics um, starting um, this month. Um, and uh, basically uh, presenting um, the portal and how it works um, to individual orthopaedic units um, across England. Um, so I'm looking forward uh, to sort of meeting you all. Um, so I'm now going to hand you back to, to Stephen, who's going to give you um, an overview of the NSIP portal and a demonstration of, of, of how it works. Brilliant. Thank you. So 50% uh, of you don't know uh, anything about NSIP so far, so that's good. So I can't contradict anything that you already know. Uh, a bit of background to NSIP. It was initiated in April 2018 with the aim to support NHS consultants with learning and continuous self-development and a portal to do so. The program uh, works cl really closely with consultant surgeons, um, such as Deborah outlined, with GERFT clinical leads and with specialty associations so that we can ensure our content is right, that we can build on the GERFT content and make sure that it's aligned and to develop specific uh, procedure groups that are relevant to clinicians. The metrics are all displayed through a secure online portal, which enables users to go in and analyze and compare their clinical activity, and most importantly, their patient outcomes against local and national benchmarks. The metrics that we'll go through within the portal range from volumes, length of stay and day case rates to reoperation and revision rates. So far uh, within the program, we have access across 11 surgical and one medical specialties, aiming to increase this to 15 specialties by the end of next year. NSIP uh, allows the user to drill down into patient level information due to our link with HES via a pseudo anonymized record. So the vision of NSIP, uh, chaired by Professor Sir Norman Williams, um, the, the vision is to improve clinical quality and safety, and we keep that absolutely at the heart of everything that we're doing on there and all the work that we're going through. Our mission is to develop high quality metrics to enable you to support uh, clinical improvements for the benefit of patient safety. Through We do this through the online portal, which I'll take you through after these short slides. NSIP have uh, a number of users. So uh, our main user base is uh, consultant surgeons. So consultant surgeons can see their own uh, information and outcomes data for NHS activity. 
So you can see NHS activity delivered in an NHS setting, NHS del activity delivered in a private setting, private activity delivered in an NHS setting, and we're working with the FIN network to be able to see private activity in a private setting to provide a complete overview of practice. Medical directors have access to the portal to be able to see the <clears throat> data for surgeons that they're responsible for across their trust at an aggregated unit level and at an consultant level and responsible officers are able to see information for their designated consultants across their providers. We are developing additional um, roles and responsibilities in there to enable a clinical lead view to have additional oversight for the practice that they're responsible for as well. It's worth stating that the program is still very much in development. We're rolling out orthopedics now because we feel that we're at a point to be able to do so. And we're seeking feedback and engagement on that. And there'll be a number of developments to the portal that continue to be improved upon and rolled out. The use cases for NSIP are appraisal and revalidation to provide an easily exportable mechanism that can be taken forwards into appraisal to be able to demonstrate objective data and high quality outcomes for use across team governance meetings in morbidity and mortality settings in clinical audit settings and to share this information in an easily digestible format to provide objective evidence within clinical impact awards and be able to demonstrate practice and to help organizations with elective recovery and ensuring that patient safety isn't being sacrificed at the expense of additional throughput through theater settings. One of the principles of NSIP was um, responding to the Patterson report. So one of the recommendations for the Patterson report was for a single repository of whole practice data, including private activity. NSIP is one of the solutions uh, to this to enable one integrated portal to be able to see an outcome of whole practice data. NSIP very much sees itself as a patient safety tool and hopes that we'll be able to develop NSIP to the point where we can use it to avoid future incidents such as Ian Patterson. NSIP works with a variety of clinical leads displayed here. The, uh, the clinicians who have a blue and red banner are also the GERF clinical leads. So you can see that we're working really closely with the GERF team as well, so that there's absolutely consistency across the metrics and so that we can make the most use of all complementary programs. NSIP is based from HES data, and we use HES data because it underpins so much, uh, so much within the NHS. It's uh, a complete data set, and it's readily available, has regular update cycles, and has complete coverage of activity. It's linkable across a number of areas, comes in a standard format, and allows us to get a really good um, base and patient tracking information within there to be able to move forwards from. We recognize that there are always limitations with data sets like these, and we have a number of work streams to try and improve, uh, improve and address these, such as uh, additional uh, information for hospital sites and working on a theater's return to improve attribution to the operating surgeon. NSIP is always looking to improve data quality and attribution. As I mentioned, working with NHS Digital on a theatre's data set to enhance attribution to the consultant who performed the operation, to bring in information for other grades of surgeons and to enable the anaesthetist to have a linked record as well. We're working, <coughs> working in a number of areas on risk adjustment, um, uh, risk adjustment models, currently presenting a crude outcome rate, but with contextualized information, working that risk adjustment model through with uh, really good success within the beta for urology on there. Finally, we're developing complication metrics to add further additional depth to the procedure dashboards and the dashboards that we display uh, today will continue to be improved upon and continue to have additional depth developed on, on there. We are working across a number of areas, as mentioned, and have significantly expanded the number of dashboards that uh, we can display back. 
within orthopedics, we now have 30 dashboards covering a range of orthopedic practice to give a really good overview of, uh, of practice data on here. And uh, in doing so, we're working with stakeholders all across, uh, all across the NHS and specialty associations and uh, continue to engage with the orthopedic specialty associations and members like yourself. We're always looking for feedback on the portal and for our coding recipes and quality metrics. <clears throat> the orthopaedic content has 30 dashboards uh, split across four subspecialties, five in foot and ankle, eight in hand and wrist, um, one covering knee, uh, hips, uh, five in knees and 11 in shoulder and elbow. Displayed uh, on here, you can see the expert clinicians that have had uh, input into some of the dashboards that we've been working with and these clinical leads are identified through engagement with the specialty associations to make sure that we had the uh, the relevant expertise on each subspecialty area. This is a list of the orthopedic procedures uh, that we have so you can see uh, that they are quite wide ranging on here and uh, the new content that we've just had released uh, this week for our new June release. We do a quarterly release cycle for additional dashboards and additional content. We have adjacent NSIP specialties as well. Um, so many of you may also have activity through our spinal surgery work stream led by Mike Hutton. Uh, within spinal surgery, we have 17 dashboards. And should you do that activity, that will also be displayed on your profile. It's one single login and one profile, and you'll be able to access that on there. Uh, as we mentioned, working, uh, working with GERFT, we believe that GERFT is complementary uh, to NSIF and vice versa. Many of the clinical leads work for both programs, so there's consistency across the coding. And we, we feel that particularly within HVLC areas, the two can be used together to look at trust level opportunities via GERFT, to then break down into individual practice within NSIP, viewing this at a unit level and then at an individual consultant level to ensure that patient safety is maintained and that high standard clinical outcomes are maintained, allowing us to go from a high level opportunity, drilling um, directly down right into the consultant level and then um, using the patient level record for further investigation and audit. <clears throat> NSIP continues uh, to increase its offering and we're looking to engage with everyone across the country, across all the specialties we're rolling out within. We have content developed across uh, 16 areas and uh, continue to add the uh, additional content such as risk adjustment and complication metrics as described before and we'll also look in the future to develop a system for flagging and alerts um, to uh, medical directors and responsible officers where um, where an organization or a unit may be uh, scoring uh, quite highly in terms of their mortality or uh, readmission areas that'll go that will provide a future flagging and alert for further investigation um, as is the case uh, with programs such as the national joint registry already <clears throat> as mentioned uh, we are looking to do uh, demo sessions with everyone uh, to take them through their own data to get them access and i'll take you through the demo in a second uh, we are working with the National Joint Registry trying to bring in this information to complement the HES activity, looking to bring that, looking to bring that in to add additional depth. We view NSIF as working in a complementary fashion to NGR at the moment, with NSIP being a quarterly release cycle and focused on the patient and post-surgical events. Um, in comparison to uh, the NGR and its slightly different focus. So we believe that these two together um, will help to provide additional context and practice. I will now move into an anonymized demo of the, uh, of the portal itself. And we'll look at a primary shoulder replacement presentation. So this is the landing page for the uh, NSIP homepage once uh, once you log in. We can see on here that there are nine dashboards available to the anonymized consultant in question. 
All the activity that's displayed on here is elective practice only and doesn't include non-elective and trauma activity. The activity for these dashboards is for patients who are 17 plus with pediatric activity in development to be released later in the year. For a dashboard to appear, there must be a minimum of six episodes across the selected period. If a user has activity at multiple providers, that will be shown within the drop down box. And as mentioned, includes NHS activity at private providers as well. And that can be viewed within NSIP. To continue, you simply select the provider that you want to see. The date ranges that we have are one year and three year periods to be selected from the drop down. And the date ranges coincide with our quarterly HES refreshes. We're working as a high priority development to enable a custom date range. Uh, box in there to segment practice further. Once, uh, once within the system, uh, to, um, to log into any of the dashboards, simply click onto the dashboard that we want to view. In this case, we're viewing the primary shoulder replacement. And then you can see on here your volume information. So we can see that there are just over 70 uh, procedures across the period, and then up to five quality metrics. Uh, we can see mortality within 30 days of admission. This will bring through mortality events at the hospital, at another hospital, or within the community due to a link we have with ONS data. Long stay information linked to a national upper quartile. Emergency readmission events within 30 days of discharge and revision shoulder replacement operations within one year and five years of operations. On the right, you can see contextualized and demographic information that always enables us to benchmark things properly. On the dashboard, this is represented through a box and whiskers chart with the explanation in the bottom right hand corner. The uh, whiskers, the, the lines at the top, are one and a half times the upper and lower interquartile ranges. And the box is the upper and lower quartile to show the range and distribution uh, within the selected metrics. The consultant, uh, the consultant uh, outcomes are the blue chip uh, located in the middle. And on there, we also have the England median uh, displayed via the solid line, an overall England rate displayed by a dotted line, and then the provider rate displayed as a uh, diagonal line on there. So you can see where they lie for each of these metrics on, uh, on here. The uh, contextualizing demographic information can be viewed on the right hand side and all of these metrics can be drilled into for further information. Here we can see the consultant profile in blue, the provider profile in light grey and a national profile in dark grey. Here we can see that the practice for the consultant in question, um, they operate on a an, on an on an older population uh, with significantly more of their practice in the 68 to 84 uh, age range category on here, and how that compares to the provider and national averages. Additional demographic information is included and can be expanded on, such as comorbidities. So where the CC score is two or more, that can be seen and broken down with this particular consultant um, having six of the 71 patients um, displayed as having a CC score of two or more. Further demographic information can be seen, such as the sex of patient and ethnicity information on here. And all of this information helps to provide additional context when we're looking at uh, our quality outcomes. The information has also been subgrouped for diagnosis and procedures. So we can see on here diagnosis subgroups such as trauma sequelae, rotator cuff syndrome, and other shoulder diagnoses. The same is true for procedure subgroups. So we can see these on here, uh, such as conventional total shoulder and reverse total shoulder. For all of these, the practice can be filtered by the diagnosis or procedure information. And when applying the filter on here, all of the outcome metrics will readjust and uh, be benchmarked for that filter. So you can see here now how these have changed and how the reverse to total shoulder is 100% of the activity. Simply go back in, reset, and reapply the filter to get back to the original viewpoint. 
all of these metrics can be drilled into for more information. So the long stay information uh, we can see on here. Within this category, five of the 64 patients uh, in question had a long stay equal to or greater than five days. That's above the provider rates of 4.9% and below the England rate of 10.1%. But when we think back to the demographic information which was displayed, we remember that this consultant's practice had a higher proportion of older patients, which explains why they have a potentially higher rate. Drilling into the patient record for each of these, we can then see further information on here and we can look at the five patients in question. We can see a pseudo-anonymized HES ID as well as the length of stay and the emission type the emission date, discharge date, age and sex of the patient. This provides sufficient information to be able to go back to a theatre or PAS record to be able to re-identify the patient directly should further details be needed. The NSIP portal allows us to drill into the information to find out additional, uh, additional information for uh, learning, reflection and review. On here, we can then see a further breakdown of the episode start and end date, uh, when the operation occurred, which was the 9th of February, which is the same as the episode start date, and we can see a breakdown of the procedure and diagnosis information. Hovering over the codes allows us to see the breakdown of what occurred. So this operation was a primary reverse prosthetic replacement shoulder joint using cement. It was a right-sided operation and the patient had rotator cuff syndrome. They also had chronic kidney disease, hypertension, and a range of additional diagnosis information that was recorded. Due to the variety of um, diagnosis information that was recorded, plus the age profile of the patient, this helps to explain why the patient was a long stay with <coughs> a length of stay of seven days. And that information can be viewed for each of those records to see if there's any learning that can be taken from that to identify any thematic review and to discuss within the team should it be necessary. This information can also be viewed for all of our metrics, such as the all-cause emergency readmission within 30 days. Here, uh, we can see that there are two patients who were uh, admitted back in an emergency setting. That compares favorably against the provider rate and the England rate for this particular consultant with a rate of 2.8%. <clears throat> Again, the patient record can be accessed and drilled into on here. And this will also show whether uh, this will also show information for the uh, consultant uh, if the patient was readmitted to another organization. On here, we can actually see that the uh, the original operation at the top, and then the emergency readmission, the darker blue underneath. We can see in, in the, this instance that the readmission occurred at the same hospital, and it was actually admitted back under the same consultant. If this was admitted to another hospital or another consultant, the same information would be viewable on here. So it provides additional information that may not be known about, particularly if the patient readmitted to another organization. <clears throat> Again, we can have a look at this additional information and see what occurred. We can see that the original operation, again, was um, a reverse uh, replacement shoulder joint using cement. Uh, it was a left-sided operation, and we can see the diagnosis information. Underneath, we can then see what occurred. Apologies. Uh, we can then see what occurred on here. And uh, we can see what procedure they had when they went back in for their readmission event. Uh, not to spoil the surprise, but they had an IV. They had an IV infusion of therapeutic substance and the diagnosis information indicated a potential infection. This type of information uh, is really valuable as it allows thematic review. It allows you to look at anything that may have occurred in another setting or another hospital. And it allows you to reflect on your practice uh, in a really readily accessible way through the NSIP portal. All metrics can also be viewed at a provider level. 
simply toggling uh, this in the uh, top left hand corner will show this information now at a provider viewpoint. Again, all of this information uh, can be drilled into for additional information. So we can now look at the long stay at a provider level and we can see how the numerator, denominator and rate have changed. The information on here can also be viewed in a funnel plot to show the distribution and uh, where this lies in terms of um, upper and uh, upper and lower ranges. The explanation for the funnel plot in the right hand corner with a 99% uh, upper control limit and a 95% upper control limit and then the same for uh, our lower control limits and our constant rate across the middle which is the England rate. We can see that the, the uh, provider in question compares extremely favorably on here and is just below the 95% uh, lower control limit when looking at uh, long stay patients. On here, we can also enable a show peers function, which will show where other providers lie in terms of a national distribution. On here, um, on here a user can actually hover over an individual dot and that will show, uh, that will show the provider in question. This is extremely useful as if you uh, if you were looking at this and you saw a provider which had uh, an increased day case rate, for example, and you had uh, peers that you knew at that organization, then you can contact them to establish what the differences are in terms of the setup and anything that they have been able to do to uh, establish uh, increased outcomes. The funnel plots can be viewed for all of the uh, individual metrics on here. Simply uh, clicking across will show where they lie in terms of the national distribution. And this can also be viewed back at a consultant level as well. Simply toggling back to the consultant view will, uh, will take you back to this screen. The consultant view uh, can also show the funnel plot distribution for each metric. Simply clicking uh, on the bottom will bring this up and show where the uh, where you lie in terms of a funnel distribution on here. For all of the information, this can be exported into a PDF document. Simply clicking on the export to PDF function in the top right hand corner. Once you wait for a minute or two, you get a little alert that says your report is ready for download. And then that's your record to keep and use, um, as mentioned, particularly useful in an appraisal setting, in a revalidation setting, and to bring the information through into, uh, into team meetings for further discussion. The PDF export is a, a really nice document uh, as displayed on here. It starts with an overview of the dashboard that you've uh, just seen and all the comparator metrics, has a handy how to read guide uh, on the right hand side, and as always has our qualifying demographic information underneath. For each uh, quality outcome metric, there is then an individual page which provides you with your breakdown for your numerator and denominator, your rate in a comparison to your overall provider rate, the overall England rate, and then all of the contextualized demographic information underneath so that these can be read appropriately and properly. And finally, at the back of the pack, there is a tabular version of all of the information so that so that the individual numbers can be picked out. And again, all of the contextualizing information is within there as well. Uh, that is uh, our presentation. So I very much hope that you enjoyed, uh, enjoyed that and uh, look forward to taking a, a big gulp of juice and uh, hearing any comments and questions. Okay, uh, Stephen, thank you for that. Uh, uh, De Debbie, do you want to add anything in there? Uh, we, we can go through the questions, both the ones that uh, you've answered and indeed the ones that haven't been answered. We can go through those now. Is there anything else you want to add to it, Debbie? For instance, your experience in Stanmore, uh, is it being used for appraisal? Has it been used for unit meetings? Uh, how far down the line are you with uh, this facility? Sure. So 
so I first became aware of NSA probably about 18 months ago when um, we were one of the trusts that were identified as a sort of early adopter. And so um, Marina and the team from NSIP came and demonstrated it um, to me and, and the unit. And um, essentially, I mean, I had all the same questions that I've seen on the Q&A chart about accuracy of data how is the data going to be used because whilst I'm here talking about it is going to personally affect my my practice um, and I think so at, at the moment I probably look at it for interest um, in terms of what am I doing or what does the head say, data say that I'm doing um, you know how do I compare with my peers across other trusts you know in terms of readmissions length of stay all of which are hot topics across the whole of the NHS and, and at our trust. Um, but I think that um, I can totally see moving forward that we as a unit will, will use this as part of our probably m, &M um, and and I will no doubt be using it um, for, for future um, uh, appraisals in conjunction with the data that we already receive from, from the NJR on, on an annual basis. I think the only other thing I would want to say um, uh, and to re-emphasize is this is sort of a first phase. Um, this, is, this is basically um, a, a portal that is in development. What, what is being published is, is as accurate as we believe it can be, but it, it's not the end point. Moving forward, the, the expectation is there will be content development um, with the help of the specialist societies and the BOA. Um, so that we can capture, you know, all elective activity, because I think at the moment is probably capturing about 50%. So we've gone for the sort of the big, large volume procedures. Um, and if you look at the remaining sort of heads data, you're down into small numbers of everything. And it's about how you represent that in a meaningful fashion uh, and how you group them to, together. And those are going to be the sort of the challenges moving forward. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so what I'll do is, um, what I might do is go to some of the answered questions, first of all. So Julian Johnson said, how does NSIP data relate to model health system data? Something I'm not familiar with. Is it a subset? Do consultants get access to that? Or is that only for specific, I presume, procedures, is what he said. I think, Stephen, you said, yeah, you're working with the NH teams to be able to log onto one system and move between systems, which is not re ready. The source data is the same and the coding is reviewed for consistency. Oh, sorry, what is model health system data, Stephen? Uh, so model health system and model hospital um, are, is a uh, collection of um, collection of a variety of metrics um, that are, are used um, a lot in GERFT, uh, a lot in GERFT packs, a lot of the GERFT information is loaded up onto Model Hospital. It's a repository to be able to see um, a lot of the benchmarked information on there and also has, uh, also has some of the similar metrics such as day case rates, uh, readmission rates, also has um, cost per operation rates uh, on there and is designed to give an overview of um, where an organization at an overall level ben benchmarks. Uh, anyone with an NHS email address can register for model hospital and model health system access. Uh, so, so that's uh, open to access on there and is aimed at the overall organizational level. Okay, thank you. Um, Eleanor Dixon said, any plans to expand to show which implants are being used in cases? I understand clinical practice can be very different depending on which supplier's product is used. For example, the shoulder. Yeah, um, uh, not at the moment. I mean, obviously uh, that, that data is available on the NJR, um, but not at the moment because this is solely based sort of on HES data and that's not really captured with the coding that we're looking at. Okay. Uh, another question, is the portal open for consultants only or any other grades? Um, I think your answer was, I think not at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's basically it's attribution. So this is sort of linked to, you know, con consultant, um, uh, I suppose data codes, if you want to call it that. 
Um, so, so at the moment it's consultants. We know that, I think the NGR have had this issue as well, as remember, some sub-consultant grades that do a lot of activity uh, under their own name, but it is registered. The activity is registered in a in a um, permanent uh, consultant um, uh, nomination. And that, that's my understanding. So I presume it's going to be the same for for this portal as well. Yep. Okay. Um, so for an orthoplasty surgeon, is there anything extra in this system compared to the National Joint Registry? Um, so I think it's about, uh, and I think I answered this, is basically it's it, through the HEADS data, you can link up sort of readmissions in other trusts for, for various reasons, but obviously with the NJR, your, your end point is, is revision. Um, so so that, that's where, you know, from, for me, who has data on the NJR and will have data on this portal, it's about complementing each other rather than repetition, which is why, as Stephen said, moving forward, the idea is, is working closely with the NJR so that they, if, if you like, can, can complement each other rather than, rather than a repetition. Sure. Okay. Um, next question was on readmissions. Can this be adjusted by the user? So at the moment, it's 30-day readmissions. However, some patients may be readmitted within six weeks or three months are, are pretty relevant, especially in orthoplasty. So can you adjust that? Can you see the readmissions within three months? Um, Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's just 30 days at the moment. Stephen, do you know if, if that's possible to adjust the uh, readmissions? So um, the, uh, the readmission uh, range can be set individually for each procedure. At the, uh, I don't know if it's possible to have a range that the user could self-select, but if there's, uh, if there are particular procedures where an extended uh, range would be of particular pertinence, then that's the type of feedback that we can take forward and discuss. And um, if we uh, if we chose to, then add that into the portal as an additional metric. Yeah. So, for instance, for orthoplasty, 30-day readmission may be related to medical comorbidities, heart attack, clot, but three months, six months readmission may be more interesting regarding, for instance, infection, dislocation, all that sort of stuff. So um, I presume it's up to us to give you feedback on that. Uh, ab Abs absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. For we're, that, Paul. we're also looking at reoperation uh, rates in a number of areas as well that we're, we're piloting through uh, spinal good. surgery. Thank you. Paul Hal Hamilton asks, how do you proceed if you feel some of the data is incomplete or incorrect? And that's a great question. Um, so you, you look at your data and say, that's not me. I don't do hip replacements. I haven't done a hip replacement in 32 years. This is, in, this is incorrect data. Where, where do you go with that information? So, Debbie, do you want to cover this or do you want me to? I, I, mean, I mean, from my perspective, if it was my, my data, the first thing I, I do is, is cross-reference it with my logbook and I don't do hip replacements. Um, and, then, um, and then I would look to the coding within the trust to find out what it is they're, they, they're coding because I, I, I take the concerns, the wider concerns of how accurate is, is the data going to be. And, and like anything, the data is only as good as what's put into it. Yeah. Um, and therefore, you know, if if you have concerns about the quality of an accuracy of the coding in your trust, then I'm sure there are processes within the individual trust to to raise those issues and, if you like, audit it and check for accuracy. So your first port of call would be locally to check the data locally. Uh, if the data is incorrect locally, you know that rubbish in, rubbish out. Um, I suppose correct it locally first. Yep. Excellent. Yeah, Sammy Davis asks, is there any scope for PROMS data to be made available to view through the portal? Another good question. So, so, so I suppose the thing is, is, is that um, the, the PROMS is captured separately to the HES data. And as I said before, this is all based on HES data. But, you know, what would, what, would, what would be seamless is if moving forward as this was developed and if we were linking in with the NJR, that data could be, could be captured on this on this portal so 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 yes i think it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic idea but not possible at the moment with the data that we are looking at yeah it sounds as if there may be a lot of work going on in parallel perhaps on the njr data 
um, the ANSIP data and also the model hospital data, um, I hope there's not duplication of effort um, for the same purpose. Um, any thoughts on that? So we, we are talking to, uh, we're, we're talking regularly to the individual who's working on the uh, model hospital um, GERF side that already looking at some of those metrics and, and bringing those in we're very focused and the long uh, in the medium and longer term of being able to bring in the additional audit registry data to really provide a, a fantastic um, repository of information that, that gives all of those additional things the NGR proms and, and so on uh, it's the it's the medium and longer term ambitions for the program as we continue to develop and work through and, and as Debbie uh, pointed out we're at the earlier stages of the program um, hoping to uh, engage with everyone get that feedback get them using it as uh, as much as possible early on so that we can have the best possible product and, and program over the coming years. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we've got four open questions. I apologize for the first one. Maybe, Claire, you might be able to help me out or Fallon here. It seems to be incomplete. A question, Julian Johnson, it pops up here. It says, are relevant people within a particular provider? I just got the feeling that the top of that question is missing. Or, or maybe is, it, is, it, is the question asking who can access the data? Because I, I think, think it was... So, oh. so I, think, I think it's a follow-on from his first question. So I think he asked... The, the question about um, model hospital, and that was a follow-on question from me. Okay, we've answered that already? Yeah, okay. Okay, thanks. So we've gone to Gareth Staples. Uh, many of you will be concerned about the reliability of the data. Oh, um, have we answered that one already? How we can we assure, reassure surgeons that this data is accurate? We sort of touched on it, but um, another question, how, how can we reassure surgeons that the data is accurate? I mean, it's all I can say. I mean, having sat down um, for a number of meetings um, with those involved in NSIP and looking at the code, one of one of whom uh, I knew when he worked at the RNOH. Uh, I mean, basically, we looked down to it to to individual cases um, and looked at actually the the descriptors as well, if it didn't make sense, and only included those that that we believe are, are accurate. But then it comes back to the previous question of, I think you said, described as rubbish in, rubbish out. And so, so therefore, you know, it's beholden on, on everybody to, you know, ensure that what the coders are inputting um, is accurate. Um, I did look into this, um, Gareth and others, that uh, uh, there is, if you go into the HES data uh, website, you'll find that um, historically has data was very unreliable, we felt, uh, and but there's a huge amount of effort has gone in to make this reliable data now with regular audits, regular contact with the trusts and the inputters, regular meetings, correction of errors. So um, uh, it, it's quite reassuring uh, when you go into the, the HES website that this data is now pretty well cleaned up. It's not like it was 10 years ago. Um, uh, certainly, that's for sure. Uh, go on to Phil Turner. Uh, does a whole unit have to sign up or can an individual surgeon access data ahead of this? So, um, so basically, the, the idea is, is that we're, we're reaching out to individual trusts and Stephen will, will correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially it, there, we have to ensure that there is governance in place in terms of sharing data. Um, and essentially, as long as the trust says yes, we can then basically uh, enable an, uh, the portal for people within the trust to access it. Um, so in principle, anyone within that trust can access it, their own individual portal. It's just whether they choose to do so or, or not. Okay. And just to be pretty clear on it, you can, you can only access your own data. You can't access anybody else's without their permission. No. Nope. Um, but there are people who can access the data now my understanding that is the medical director yep the, mm -hmm. the chief responsible officer yep the um, same thing. is is that it yes okay what about the clinical director who commonly sort of runs um unit meetings and subspecialty meetings um in fact Locally, we've had this question and why can't the clinical directors access this data? So the direction of travel on, on there is that 
uh, we're developing a clinical, what we term as a clinical lead view, so that the clinical director or the clinical lead would be able to have an overview uh, of the dashboards for the activity that they're responsible for. So they would be able to have a, a access to uh, the overall unit level and the consultant level um, information for the practice that they are responsible for on behalf of the organisation. You'd want to be sure that that's updated because clinical directors come and go on a regular basis, especially since COVID. Uh, I think Absolutely. Um, a lot of clinical directors have dropped in and out. So that data would really need to be kept up to date. You would not want a retired clinical director having access to people's data. So that would really need to be ultra secure, yep. in my opinion. We have, uh, a, we have an extremely regular... Um, we have an extremely regular refresh of information from ESR that lets us know of any users who've uh, who've dropped off, okay. so they're automatically uh, or removed from the system. Thank you again. So Gareth Staples again. So the take-home message for me is: it's vital that we get a handle on our coding stochastic data input locally before this information is disseminated more widely. That's not a yeah, question. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. I probably fair. I think engaging with coders, uh, uh, we do get feedback from our coding on various operations we do. I think it's on a monthly basis now. But in engaging engaging with your coders is, is vital uh, because they are the ones that in input um, the data. So um, staying close to them is very important. Uh, Phil Turner, I'm doing work with the CQC on setting threshold levels to trigger unit inspections. NSIP looks really useful and goes beyond the model hospital interpretations. Would it be possible to discuss? Absolutely, Phil. Um, um, we know where you're living. Um, Stephen Lois, Stephen, could you get in touch with Phil Turner if that's possible? Yeah. Uh, and, and touch base uh, with, with Phil. Uh, that would be. Um, that would be very, very useful. As you know, Phil is uh, actively involved in the British Orthopaedic Association. The more people get involved as well. And we're hoping to spread the word through through the British Orthopaedic Director Society as well. So we're in some discussions about this, but get, getting the word out is, is very important, I think. So I think we are at the end of our question and answer session. What I'm gonna do now, if it's okay, it's 13.54. I think um, I will share my screen, but in the meantime, can you, Fallon, can you pop, pop up the, uh, the exit poll, please? If that's possible. Thank you. So there's two questions. One is a presentation and sip at my appraisal. After this presentation, would you be happy to use your NSIP for appraisal? And the second one is about using NSIP at unit meetings, audit meetings, uh, that sort of thing, where the data would be shared. So if you could, if you could vote now, please, thank you. So there you have it. So 100% yes, 100% um, yes. Well, sounds very positive. Um, I think that's that's going to be the way forward. Um, what I, I'm not sure of, maybe just one last question. What if at appraisal I decide I do not want to discuss my NSIP at my appraisal? Go with that. Has anybody any thoughts on that? Well, I suppose at the moment it's not a it's not a requirement, but I suppose the question I would have is is why not? Why not? Yeah, I think that's the question will be asked, and I think there'll be more information coming through for our appraisal. It'll be a more detailed appraisal going forward with lots of lots of use, uh, very useful uh, data from NSIP and other sources. Okay, so um, 
I'm just going to go back to my presentation, if that's okay. Um, and basically, I want to just thank uh, Stephen and Debbie for for talking to us. I've got a feeling we're going to hear a lot more, a lot more presentations, a lot more about this going forward. And uh, I thank you for your present for your presentations today. And um, if um, the contacts are there, if anybody wants to contact these people separately, I think there's probably an indication to have these presentations in every trust. And um, this webinar will be recorded. And uh, for NOA members anyway, um, you should be able to use the recording if you want to introduce the topic of NSIP. So that, that could be useful to you. Uh, I'm not sure what the situation with non-members are, but I'm sure it will be possible to get a hold of this presentation because the, the question and answer session was particularly useful. And I thank you for that. Uh, moving forward, um, basically, I've, I've been told that uh, the deadline for the NOA Excellence Awards has been extended to the middle of July. Um, we're very keen that every trust in, in the members uh, do do, do send in some applications. There's one or two trusts uh, who have actually not sent send in any applications, which is a little bit disappointing. So that's why we've extended uh, the entry, if you could spread the word. Um, our next webinar is in September, and we're going to focus on uh, specialist commissioning. It was cancelled from today uh, because getting hold of people in uh, NHS improvement in, in England is, is, is particularly difficult at the moment, but we're hoping to resolve that issue before September. Uh, we have our AGM on the 19th of, of October. Uh, at that, we will be, there'll be pre presentation of awards. Um, there's various suggestions for future webinars, but if you have anything that you think that we should present, please let us know uh, and we'll, we can look at that. Um, there is a suggestion that we may look at all the terminology around LGBTQT+, uh, what's happening there, um, what's appropriate in, 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 in language terms. So we may wrap a, web, a webinar around, around that, but please give us some feedback on um, the webinars and please give us some suggestions uh, moving forward. On that note, it's just two o'clock. So I'm gonna say thank you to everybody. Thank you, thanks to, Claire and Fallon, everybody behind the scenes for organizing the webinar. And uh, I wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you and bye.